In this video, we're going to take a few minutes to talk about the different representations for chemical compounds. Okay, so to start things off, let's talk about, you know, perhaps the representation that everybody's most familiar with, which is this concept of a molecular formula, right? So a molecular formula represents a compound by basically using the chemical symbols, chemical symbols you get off the periodic table, to indicate the types of atoms that are present, okay? And then we're going to put a subscript on every chemical symbol that, that it, to show the number of atoms of that particular element, okay? So for example here, our first example, ammonia, we have NH3, okay? So if there is no subscript, then we're assumed that that subscript is, there's an implied one there. You have one of that specific element. And in this case, nitrogen has that subscript of one, right? So we have one nitrogen. And hydrogen has a subscript of three, which means you have three hydrogen atoms, okay? So we can represent ammonia, NH3, using the molecular formula right here, okay? Now, alternately, we can also write down a model that illustrates the actual bonds that are present, how each one of those different uh, elements are connected to the other elements. And that's what we see here. So we, we will oftentimes see this little line structure where a line is used to connect the different atoms of the appropriate type. And then finally, we can get this so-called ball and stick model, which extends the little line structure to represent the actual three-dimensional arrangement of those individual atoms or elements. Okay, so we're going to see all three of these different representations, you know, throughout the course. Later on in the course, we'll talk about different rules and principles you can use to get these line structures or three-dimensional geometries. But for right now, um, don't not, don't worry as much as where those come from, but know what they're representing. Okay, so another example here, we have this C2H2 acetylene, right? So acetylene has two carbons and two hydrogens stick model right here and we can see the little ball and stick model uh, or the line model here uh, and the little ball and stick model over here and of course we can do this same sort of procedure for uh, compounds that are arbitrarily large so to go on the you know larger an example of a larger compound here let's look at glucose glucose has the molecular formula of C6H12O6. And if you look at the line structure, right, we've got an awful lot of hydrogens, carbons, and a lot of different bonding arrangements here, and an equally complicated ball and stick model over here. So we can continue to extend this as far as we wanna go, okay? And so remember the conventions when we're writing out these molecular formulas, subscripts of one, we're typically gonna leave out, that's an implied one, and when you are listing out the different elements uh, in a molecular formula, the convention is to list the more metallic elements first. Okay? It's just a general convention that we all try and follow. Okay, so these examples that I've given you um, uh, really fall in the, you know, the different representations, I should say, that I've given you in these examples fall into a couple different categories, okay? So the first is a concept of structural formulas. So structural formulas provide the same information as that molecular formula. In other words, it tells you exactly how many of each atom type, but it also shows how these atoms are connected um, in the molecule. So structural formulas are these little line models that we saw on the previous slide on the previous examples, okay? So each one of these lines represents a chemical bond um, that we'll have a lot more to say about later on in the class. Basically, it's holding together those atoms and we come up with our structural formula, right? We can take the structural formula a step further and put together a so-called molecular model where we actually represent not only the connectivity of the atoms, but also the molecular geometry or shape, okay? And the two common ways that we'll see this done We've already saw the ball and stick model in the previous examples. There's also a space filling model that helps us get an idea for um, you know, the 
regions of space around those this nuclear framework that defines a given compound where we are most likely to find electrons. Okay? And when we're building up these molecular models here at the end, right, there's some conventions we follow, and the conventions really come down to uh, coloring. Okay? And so the coloring um, will typically be black will be the color used for carbon, white will be used for hydrogen, oxygen will be red, and then there's a list of other conventions that we'll see. Um, but remember that you know when you start representing all the diverse elements on the periodic table, you can run into situations where, uh, especially with some of these less commonly found elements, that there's no specific color uh, associated with them. Okay, so it's it's a convention that's used that we, we stick to for a lot of the commonly occurring elements, and and we'll see more and more examples of this as we move through the course. Okay, so this is our molecular formula. Now, what we want to do is now introduce a another formula that you're perhaps not as familiar with, and this is the concept of empirical formula. Okay, so the empirical formula unlike the molecular formula, just provides the relative number of atoms of each type in a molecule, okay? So remember, the molecular formula gives you the actual number, right? Empirical formula gives you the relative number of each atom type. Okay, so let's look at an example here, benzene, okay? Benzene has a molecular structure that looks like this over here on the right hand side, or a structural formula where you can see we've got our six different carbons all arranged in this neat looking ring structure with a hydrogen poking out sort of radially in all directions, one on each one of the carbons, okay? So of course, the molecular formula for this compound is C6H6. So to determine the empirical formula, we need to look at, well, what is that fundamental ratio of carbon to hydrogen atoms? Well, hopefully you can see here, it's, a, it's exactly a one-to-one -one ratio, okay? So the empirical formula is simply going to be CH, okay? Similarly, acetylene, okay? We saw the structure of acetylene on a previous slide. Molecular formula is C2H2. Once again, we have this one-to-one -one ratio or an empirical formula of just CH, okay? Going back to our glucose example, more complicated compound, we know that the glucose molecular formula is C6H12O6, right? So a little bit more complicated here. If we look at the smallest whole number ratio, right, we will find that there is actually one carbon, two hydrogens, and one oxygen in that lowest ratio, okay? And this empirical formula here gives us some insight into why glucose is a member of a class of compounds called carbohydrates, okay? It looks like a hydrate of carbon, hydrate, water, H2O, right? For When you have a carbohydrate, glucose being one example of a carbohydrate, you have one H2O molecule for every carbon atom, okay? So CH2O here for that empirical formula. Right. So if you want to determine the empirical formula and you already know the molecular formula, then all you have to do is divide the subscripts by the greatest common factor. Okay. Okay. And what I mean by the greatest common factor, it's the largest number that divides exactly, with no remainder, into all of the subscripts. Okay. So for example, if I want to determine the empirical formula for C4H8, we need to identify, well, what is the greatest common factor? What's the largest number that divides both of these subscripts, four and eight, with no remainder? Well, of course, the greatest common factor is four. So we're gonna divide both those subscripts by four, and we will come out the other end with an empirical formula of CH2. Okay, so as another example, uh, we could find the <clears throat> empirical formula for CCl4, right? Well, in this case, the greatest common factor is one. We already have in the molecular formula a one of the elements with only a single atom, right? So as a result, the empirical formula 
which we obtain by dividing both of those subscripts by one, it returns the exact same formula. So in this case, the empirical and molecular formulas are identical, right? So basically, right, we're continuing along, you know, when you find a molecular formula and you see a subscript of one showing up, you know you're done. You never have to do anything more, right? Um, last example here, if we want to determine the empirical formula for B2H6, right, again, the, the greatest common factor of two and six is going to be two, divide both coefficients by two, and we will come up with our empirical formula BH3. Okay, so that sums things up. Basically, what we've seen here is the three common ways that you will see atoms being represented. We have the so-called molecular formula, where you just write out all the elements, put a subscript for the number of each element type, and you're good to go. We have these uh, structural formulas where we make these little line models where we use lines to represent bonds, get an idea of connectivity of atoms, and then we have these molecular structures where we see balls and sticks or space filling models to represent the molecular geometry. And finally, we've introduced this concept of empirical formulas where we have this lowest whole number ratio of the different atom types. So with that, you're all set to be able to explore the different uh, concepts in chemistry that we'll be talking about throughout the course and you know, have some way to interpret all these different formulas and all these different uh, images that you'll be seeing.